Uh, welcome back everyone. I think we'll get started on um, part two as we're running a bit behind. Um, the first part of the second uh, se session is going to be a sort of canter through um, uh, the enforcement of IP rights in uh, different jurisdictions in Europe. Uh, we'll be covering Germany, the UK and France. Um, kicking off uh, with Germany is uh, Holger Alt. He is a partner at von uh, Betteker. He specialises in the enforcement type of IP rights and has advised uh, clients in the fashion and luxury sectors. Uh, he's also a member of ERC's uh, executive committee for Germany. Well, um, yeah, my topic is the enforcement of IP rights in Germany. And when I say IP rights, I will talk about trademarks, but the same will apply to design rights or copyrights. Um, when we look at the EU, the trademark law is more or less the same in all member states. But if you want to enforce the trademark rights, you have to do this in accordance with the national procedural law. And uh, I want to point out some German characteristics in this context. And I would like to start with the situation if the trademark owner finds out that there's an infringement. So the first question is, should I and how should I contact the infringer? And there we have the common practice in Germany to send a so-called cease and desist letter. Um, this is a letter you're explaining that you think that's a trademark infringement and you request the infringer to offer a cease and desist declaration. And what is a cease and desist declaration under German law? It's not a simple um, declaration to say I will not use the trademark any longer in the future. That would not be sufficient to avoid court proceedings. Such undertaking has to be secured by a contractual penalty. So you have to undertake that you will pay appropriate contractual penalty for each violation or breach of your undertaking in the future. Um, to just give you an idea what is an appropriate contractual penalty, because if you offer to pay £10, it would be of course not appropriate. And the standard amount is between 5,000 and 1 to 10,000 euro for each violation. What you also can do is what we call the Hamburg practice. Hamburg, because the Hamburg courts were the first courts who accepted this model. And then you don't offer a specific amount. You just say you will pay an appropriate amount, which have to be determined by the trademark owner and can be reviewed by the courts. So you put the risk a little bit on the trademark owner if he wants claims 20,000 euro and the court at the end says, no, it's just a minor violation, it's only 5,000, then you have to pay part of the court fees. So you put a little bit risk on the <coughs> trademark owner. Um, you have to keep in mind that this German system is, can be very dangerous. I'll give you an example, we had represented a client um, against the Spanish fashion brand. They were operating about 50 stores in Germany and they have easily offered uh, uh, such declaration with a contra contractual penalty of 5,000 euro. And then we have found out that in around <coughs> 20 stores in Germany they were still selling the infringing products. Uh, we have found around 40 pieces. And then we went to them and said, okay, 20 stores, 20 violations, multiplied with 5,000 euro, we want to have 100,000 euro. And the Spanish company was of course shocked and said, sorry, you want 100,000 euro for 40 pieces? He said, yes, because this is a contractual penalty. So you have to be very careful if you want to offer such declaration. Because you have to keep in mind, from the second you offer such declaration, <coughs> The infringing sign should not be found any longer on, the w on your website, on marketing materials, or that you have infringing items in all of one of your stores. If you, if you cannot do this, you should not offer this declaration. You should let the other party go to court, get a court order. You have to pay the court fees. We will see later how much it is. 
but it's much cheaper uh, as to pay contractual penalties. So just do not easily sign such declaration. Um, the next question is, if our, is it necessary under German law always to send such letter before going to court? And the clear answer is no. There's, it's not mandatory to send such letter before going to court. As you can see, there's a but. And the problem is if the defendant immediately acknowledges the claims in the proceedings, the trademark owner has to bear all the court fees and attorney fees. Um, that's, so this is a financial risk if you go directly to court. So the common practice is, of course, sending a cease and desist letter in advance. There's, of course, an exception if your claims also contain claims for searches or destruction. Then, of course, it is not necessary to send a warning letter before. Because if you send something, a warning letter, I will come to your premises and search for infringing counterfeits. It makes no sense. Of course, then you can directly go to court. doesn't matter if the other part, uh, party immediately acknowledges the claims. They have to bear all the court fees and attorney fees. Then we go one step further, we come to litigation. So the other party has not offered such declaration, so we have to go to court. And then the German system offers a very effective legal remedy. We have on one hand the standard proceedings, and then we have fast track proceedings, which we call the preliminary injunction or injunction. It's a court order you can get normally in within 24 to 48 hours. So, very fast. And, as you can see, you will normally get such injunction ex parte, without notice. What does it mean? General rule is that you file an application with the court. If the judge thinks your case is well founded, he will grant such injunction without an overhearing without any notification of the defendant. And then the trademark owner has one month's time to serve the injunction on the defendant. And from that second, they have the sales ban. They are not allowed to sell the, thing, the products any longer. And that is also the first moment they get knowledge about that they, the existence of such injunction. So this is a very IP owner-friendly system. You can, of course, appeal such uh, injunction. But uh, if you think that you have a, a, a product launch of a new product with a big marketing campaign, and then on the first day or the second day you get such injunction, it could be uh, very, very um, dangerous for you. Um, and also, that is a, that it's such IP owner-friendly system is the reason that uh, a lot of uh, international uh, companies come to Germany to solve their international conflicts. I'll give you another example. We have represented a Finnish fashion brand against an uh, Italian fashion brand. Mm. Um, the Finnish mm. um, company, our client, has a very famous design, which was also protected as a trademark. And the Italian brand uh, has used a very similar design on the whole collection worldwide. And um, the, our client has contacted uh, the Italian brand in Italy that they should stop that and for four or five months nothing happened. So they come to Germany and what we have done is we have looked who is selling the products in Germany. And we found out that, for example, the uh, Alster House and the KDW are flagship department stores like Harrods in London, uh, belonging to the Karstadt Group at that time, were selling this. So we sent cease and desist letters and injunctions to the commercial customers, to the Karstadt Group, and also to the uh, German uh, affiliate of the Italian brand. So that we had a um, sales ban for Germany within three weeks. And, of course, the Karstadt Group put a lot of pressure on the Italian brand to come back to the table to negotiate a global settlement. 
they can say this is not our dispute, this is your dispute, but we have a court order here on our table. We are not allowed uh, to sell products any longer. Please handle the case. And that was the reason that they come to the table and we could, could be reached uh, a global settlement <coughs> with a compensation payment within uh, six months. So this is something maybe you can uh, keep in mind for your global or your client's global IP strategy because the German market is normally <laughs> for all luxury brands a very important market. If you can stop them there very easily, they might come to, to, to back to settlement talks. Also, it is, as I said, it's very effective not to attack the brand owner but also attack the commercial customers because they put pressure on the brand. Um, just to give you some more facts about the injunction, um, you can bring claims for cease and desist for disclosure and for sieging of uh, infringing goods, but you cannot get any money in injunction proceedings. So you cannot claim damages or cost reimbursement in injunction proceedings. If you want to have money from the other side, you have to uh, choose the standard proceedings. Very important point is, of course, that the matter must be urgent. And uh, what is urgent? Um, it is, you only have, it depends from court district to court district, about between four and six weeks from the point that you get uh, aware of the infringement to filing the application with the court. You have four to six weeks. If you wait longer, the court will probably dismiss your uh, uh, application because they say, okay, if you have waited so long, it's not urgent, so please use the standard proceedings. So you have always to keep this in mind if you want to use such injunction system, you have to be very fast to react. Because this is always the first question, if somebody comes to me, what uh, should help in, in Germany, I will always ask, how long do you know about the infringement? And then they say, well, yeah, about two, three months. So, okay, sorry. Then we can, of course, use the stand proceedings, but not the effective injunction proceedings. Just to give you an idea how important the injunction proceedings in Germany are, approximately 80% of all infringement claims are, or conflicts are settled on the decision in injunction proceedings. Only 20% are going up to standard proceedings. One reason for this is, of course, uh, first of all, the same judges will decide on the case. So it don't, if you don't have new evidence or new witnesses, maybe it, you will not convince uh, the judge to change uh, his mind. And the other uh, thing is that um, it is not very easy to claim damages in, in Germany. The courts are very strict, and that's the reason that uh, getting damages from the other side is not really uh, on the focus uh, if you go to the German court. And uh, as I said, all other things like uh, that they stop it or that uh, information you will get also in the injunction proceedings. Then also let have a look about how long it will take and uh, the cost of German proceedings. Um, for the fast track proceedings it takes about three months to get a final decision of the second instance court, which is the last instance in this field. Uh, if you go to use the standard proceedings you will have around one year for the first instance and one to one to half year more for the second instance. So in the end, two and a half years. So there you can see how important it is to act very fast because if you can get to stop your competition within three months or you have to wait two and a half years, but then the collection will be off the market, of course. Um, with regard to costs, um, proceedings in Germany are less expensive uh, than in the UK or US. Um, one reason for this is that we don't know anything like uh, discovery or pre-trial discovery. So we do not exchange a huge amount of information or documents. 
So this is, which is very time consuming, therefore costly. Um, to give an idea about the court fees, court fees are determined on the value of the case. A standard value for trademark cases are 100,000 to 500,000 for famous brands. So you can see the court fees about 2,700 or 10,000 euro, which you have to, to, to pay in advance as the uh, claimant. Also, an advantage of the injunction proceedings, you have not, you have not to pay the money in advance. So you can just file the application, and if you win, then the other side has to be in the court fees. Attorney fees. Very important point, of course, for brand owners. Um, if there is no fee agreement, then our statutory fees will apply. Also, depending on the value of the matter, you can say for, for the first instance, including an oral hearing, the cost will be between 3,800 to around 9,000. But of course, most of the <laughs> IP firms in Germany work on hourly rates uh, or flat fees, and that will be, of course, higher than the statutory fees. But we, we have to, uh, they are also very important, we will see in a moment. Um, to, to, to give, give you an idea, uh, for an injunction proceeding, you will have to pay around uh, 10,000 to 15,000 euro, and for a standard proceeding, about yeah, 20,000 to 30,000 euro. So this is less expensive than the UK, but it's higher than the statutory fees. You will probably very hard, uh, very hard to find a lawyer who's working for these fees for a whole trademark case. But you have also under German law a claim for cost reimbursement. So if you win the case, you will get money back. You will, the other party has, of course, to pay the court fees and have to pay your attorney fees. But this claim is limited to the statutory fees. So you don't get back your actual fees in Germany. So it might be that you have to spend 15,000 euro to your own lawyer, but only maybe get back 4,000. Some other countries you get your actual uh, le legal fees, that's not the case in Germany. Um, coming to the end, I just want to mention, I called it forum shopping. Um, you have to keep on in mind that we have about, in Germany, 30 different courts with jurisdiction to hear trademark cases. We have not only have uh, uh, courts located in London, we have it all around the country and therefore the, the, the case law differs from court district to court district. And especially in injunction proceedings because our federal court has no jurisdiction to hear cases in injunction proceedings. These matters are urgent. Our judges at the federal court want to, don't to deal with urgent things. They want to think about things. Um, so the higher regional courts, so the second instance is also the last instance in injunction proceedings. That means that the court, the case law, really differs from court to court. So it can be that you will definitely lose with your case in Frankfurt but you will definitely win it in Munich. So uh, choosing the right court is, is, can be very important for the outcome of your case. And it is very easy under German law to get the jurisdiction of a special uh, court. You can easily make a test purchase or something like that. Just to, or you have just to explain that you have an interest in this court district to stop them there and then you can go directly to the court you have chosen. This was a very short, very briefly overview about the German system. If you have any questions, of course, I will be happy to answer it. Would you like to say a few words about protective writs when you're acting for a respondent? Yeah, um, what is the, we, we call it in German a protective writ or protective brief. Uh, 
as I said, the injunction system is very IP owner friendly. Um, you go to court and you're discussing the case with the judge and the other party, the defendant, doesn't know anything about it. <laughs> and so uh, it, it, we have the possibility um, if you think that somebody will go to court and try to get an injunction against you, we can call uh, uh, such a protective brief which we can file with the court. It's just a normal writ where you explain your position, you bring your arguments and you're requesting the judge not to decide without an oral hearing because this is in the discretion of the judge. He can say, well, I'm not convinced of the case, I, I will dismiss your application. He can say, uh, I, I will have an oral hearing, I want to hear the arguments of the other side, or he can uh, just grant the injunction, what they in 95% in practice do. So this is the reason that we file such arguments in advance by the, uh, to the court, that he will read it, if he gets the, uh, the application for an injunction on the table, he also will read our arguments and say, okay, this might change his opinion or not. So this is a, yeah, this is, you can try to, to, to limit your risk to be served with an injunction without notice. Can I just say that, um, and without uh, breaching any client confidentiality, but Harvey and I uh, last month worked together on a case where uh, my instructing solicitors um, brought to me um, a letter which uh, my clients didn't seem to know anything about, and they asked me what we should do about it. Having read uh, uh, Holger's slides in preparation for this talk, it occurred to me that this might be the first step to getting a preliminary injunction, and I told them what might, might, might happen to them. And uh, uh, we uh, did instruct Holger, who uh, wrote uh, all sorts of uh, uh, protective writ uh, letter, protective brief letters to the 40 jurisdictions in Germany. We don't yet know the outcome of the case, but we do know that there are negotiations to settlement conducted in a very amicable way. Mm -hmm. So uh, it can work the other way around, and I can certainly recommend Holger as a very, very good representative from the English Council, of the English lawyers. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're running a bit behind, so we might actually move on. Uh, thank you very much, Holger.